so it's time for a scripture reading. It's Romans 7, 24 to 25. And because I didn't have that ready to go, I'm going to read it right here with you. Oh, hey. Hey, Jeff, one at a time here, okay? You or me. All right, usually it's you because you do this better. Romans 7, 24 and 25. There is no happiness in me. Who can set me free from my sinful old self? God's law has power over my mind, but sin still has power over my sinful old self. I thank God I can be free through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. That's right, man. That's, uh, that's something. Now, Jeff, am I, am I bringing this back with me? Where does... All right, we're gonna, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Evan, who, uh, who also cares if men go to hell. Just throw that out there. Glad you know, Dave. <laughs> hey, happy Sabbath again, everybody. Um, today's sermon is called A New Life. And... Uh, Let's say a, a word of prayer as we begin. Dear Father in heaven, uh, please take these words and uh, multiply them and grow and make a new life for us from the things that are spoken today. And may you, your Son, and the Spirit be glorified in, uh, in everything that's said here and in all the thoughts thought. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's sermon is called A New Life. Um, throughout the centuries, people have sought a new life, actually. Uh, there's something in us that has a sense of dissatisfaction. And I think it's because we, we feel that something's not right on this earth. So people, you know, you have Abraham in the scriptures. He uh, started out journeying as a man with great wealth, with... Uh, goats and servants and money and lots of food and he was journeying looking for a new life a better country which was the land that God had promised him it was actually an earthly promised land that God had promised him um, then uh, later in the centuries there were a group of people named the Israelites the Hebrew people and they were slaves in Egypt for um, I believe it was 400 years or so. And they were oppressed. And undergoing that oppression and that, that sense that things weren't right, they sought a new life. And God gave that to them in the promised land. Now, they did have to wait 40 years in the wilderness because they weren't ready for their new life yet. God took some time to get them ready for that new life. Uh, then later in history, the Israelite people went into captivity into Babylon because uh, they had broken the land Sabbaths. They didn't keep the weekly Sabbath. Uh, they didn't keep justice and mercy and take care of the orphans and the widows and look after people. And... Then they went into captivity into Babylon, and after being in Babylon for a number of years, they realized that they needed a new life. And God brought them out of Babylon, actually, and he began to reestablish them as a people with a new life to give the good news about the Messiah that would come in a number of years. And... Uh, we just see this pattern throughout history. I mean, even in the Dark Ages, people living in Europe under the oppression of the Roman Church. Eventually, that sought people, or not sought people, but that led people to seek refuge in the United States of America. Um, there were people here before um, the, uh, the Europeans came over, but in large part, the people that came from Europe came here because they were seeking a better country. They were seeking a better place uh, away from the oppression that was going on in Europe. 
Um, unfortunately, they, some of the people oppressed the people that were here and, to get their new life. Not everyone was that way, but that, that did happen. Um, and I think there's a lesson in all of this is um, there are blessings in this life. We have, you know, the excitement of um, coming to a new job, moving into a new home, starting a new phase in our schooling. Um, whatever it is, a new job, a new business endeavor. And we, we often have hope for something better and something more. And it, it kind of keeps us going, you know, when you look forward to something, it's easier to do everything. Anyone ever experienced that? Like, maybe you were in school, or you're working now, and then there's something that comes up, like you're going to go on vacation, um, there's a family member that's coming to visit, or there's a new project you're working on, and you have that in the back of your mind, and it keeps you going through the day, because you're looking forward to something. There's just something better that keeps you going through the grind, the difficulties of, of daily life and the boredom of it. And uh, that's, you know, it's good to have that. But when you've been through the cycle a, a number of times with even hoping for things on this earth, you start to realize there's got to be something more than, than what we have on this earth. Because the hopes and the excitements of daily life, they come and they go, and one day they, they will actually be taken away. Uh, especially like Dave mentioned, uh, in the time of Jacob's trouble, when we become like Job, and everything gets wiped out. In, in case you're wondering, if you want to know what the time of Jacob's trouble's like, read the book of Job. That's actually what it's going to be like uh, for us. So uh, that's a good lesson to prepare for that. Um, so, a new life is something that God has promised us. Not just things of the earth, but a heavenly life. And that is the hope that's going to keep us going through the difficulties of this life, when the things, the excitements, and the joys of life come and they go. But the hope in an eternal life, a new body, a clear mind, and uh, being with God in heaven is what's going to keep us going through these last days. And I want to uh, share some things with you today from the scriptures that uh, I hope will give you some encouragement to keep your hope locked on to that new life and enjoy the good things of life, but keep your hope higher. Keep your hope up in heaven where things won't come and go, where it will always be and where it will always remain. Uh, let's go over to uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. In verse 14. Romans seven fourteen. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would do, or for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. 
but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And then here's what Dave read for us. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. This was Paul's experience when he recognized that he was a sinful man. And from this type of experience arises our hope in a heavenly life. When you look into the law of God, when you look at the life of Jesus, it's possible that your hope could be crushed because you see that you're not like that. You look at the Ten Commandments, loving God and your neighbor with all your heart. You know, don't kill, don't steal, keep the Sabbath, don't commit adultery, don't lust after worldly goods, covetousness, don't do that. Honor your father and your mother. Don't worship other gods. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Don't steal. All these things. When you see that you're not like that, you could kind of crush your spirit because the wages of sin is death. And uh, what the serpent said in the garden wasn't true, that we won't die. We, we will actually die. And, you know, it's, it's a sad situation uh, that that has to be. And then Paul, here in his writing, he says, I'm carnal, I'm fleshly, I'm sold under sin, I'm doomed to death. But the law is spiritual. And we know in the scriptures that the spirit gives life. Now, of course, the law doesn't save us, but there's life in keeping the law of God. Because if the wages of sin is death, and you die by not keeping it, you live when you live in the law of God. But there's a problem here. We can't actually undo our record of sin through keeping the law. We can't do it. Every nice thing we would try to do to make up for all the bad we've done, it doesn't cut it. One little speck of sin, one little stain on our clothes, one stain on our garments, one blot on our conscience is enough to send us to the grave and be lost eternally. The smallest thing, the smallest thing, And Paul recognized it. He says, hey, in my mind I know what's right, but my body wants to do these other things, and I, I, don't, I don't have the strength. I can't do it. I can't, I can't overcome my body. And then he said in verse 24, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Paul was gra um, grasping for a new life, actually. He was grasping for hope. And because of his experience with the Lord, he was able to answer, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He recognized his hope in a new life in Jesus. This is the power and the gravity of what Jesus means to us. He's our hope in a new life. He deserves our heartfelt service, our full attention and obedience because of what he's done for us. And this new life that he promises isn't just eternal life, but there's 
I mean, there's actually more to, than just living forever. You know, you've heard people say, well, growing up, you know, I used to see in cartoons that in heaven you sit on a, sit on a cloud and play a harp. And, you know, what are we going to do? It seems kind of boring. I mean, personally, I know I wouldn't want to sit around on a cloud all day and play a harp. I don't even want to do that now, actually. I mean, like, I don't know. <laughs> even if I could play a harp, I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, it'd be nice to play one sometimes, but I'd rather go do stuff. <laughs> so the good news is that God gives us hope in a new life. And it's not just that life on a cloud playing a harp or, you know, just sitting and studying the Bible all day. That's not what the new life is. There'll be a balance of, of a multitude of different things. We'll study God's word. We'll interact with um, angelic beings. We'll visit other planets. We'll get to uh, investigate the secrets in the laboratories of nature. There's going to be so much new or so, much good, so many good things in the new life that God offers in heaven. And we get to have Jesus right there with us, teaching us, accompanying us, and uh, being our everlasting friend and redeemer. That's what we have to look forward to in this new life. So we're not just seeking a better job, new school, new learning, uh, new relationship. We, we're not, we won't be stuck in this cycle of um, gain-seeking like we hear on earth of new things. We will be content and happy in heaven, learning, being with Jesus, and enjoying the, the simple and the glorious joys that he has to offer us. Um, if you take a look back in the Garden of Eden, you see Adam and Eve there. Um, Adam named the animals. God gave him work to do. Um, we know from um, inspired writings that Adam and Eve would tend plants and kind of cause them to grow different ways. And their home was even made of, uh, of uh, branches and plants, and there was fruit around. So we, have a, we really do have a better country and a new life to look forward to in heaven. And God is trying to get us in these last days to a place where our hopes are not set on the things of the earth, where we're not continually hoping for something the next day. He wants us to, to shift our focus from the day-to-day -day tasks to being cognizant and remembering of our hope that's in heaven. We, need, we do need to continue the things of this daily life, but the thing that drives us and keeps us going through these difficulties should be our hope in heaven to be with Jesus and to take other people there so they can live there with him too. And how is this all possible? This is possible through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, another thing we have to look forward to, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. So one thing we have to look forward to is being eventually free from this body of sin and death and not having this continual internal struggle that we have uh, here on the earth. We get to be free from that. 1 Corinthians 15, here's something else. Um, let's go to uh, verse 12 here. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ isn't risen, then is our preaching in vain? And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. 
then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Okay, I'm going to explain this a little bit here. Um, writing to the Corinthian church, Paul's saying that, um, that the resurrection did happen because there were some people that were saying there was, there was no resurrection of the dead. That probably came from the Sadducees. And he's saying, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, then what we're doing is pointless here. That's what he's telling the, the Corinthians. He's, he's trying to show them the importance of the, the doctrine of resurrection. Because if, if, if there is no resurrection of the dead, and if Christ didn't rise, he says, our preaching is in vain. We're wasting our time, and we're miserable. We're basically miserable because we have a false hope. But that's actually not the case. Christ did raise from the dead. And Paul was trying to remind them of that. And here's the hope that he points them to um, in that resurrection. And this is something we have to look forward to. Let's go over to verse... Uh, okay, I lost my place here. Let's see. Okay, verse uh, 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Fool, that which you sow is not quickened, except it dies. And that which you sow, you sow not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as it has pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fish, and another of birds. There are celestial bodies, terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. One star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It's sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, there's a spiritual body. Okay. He's answering the question, people are saying, hey, well, if we're resurrected from the dead, what kind of body are we going to have? And then Paul goes into a, a few examples of how there's different grains, there's different um, uh, celestial bodies, there's things on the earth. He's saying there's all kinds of different things. And that for, especially in the plant world, for a plant to grow from a seed, the seed itself kind of has to die in the ground first before it can be brought to life. And he's using this to uh, talk about resurrection and point them to the hope that they have. So that's, that's what's going to happen with us. We are, we are put in the grave, we die, and then at the resurrection, we are given a new body, a spiritual body, not a natural body like we have now, but a spiritual body that is uh, made alive by the Holy Spirit, who is the seal for the day of redemption. See, it's the Holy Spirit that lives in us that gives us the new resurrection life um, at the coming of Christ. And here's what we have to look forward to. Has anyone ever had some kind of health problem or injury? Anyone ever had some kind of health problem or injury? Or does? Anybody? Wow. I guess you guys don't need to be resurrected. You're going to live forever. Uh, um, but really, though, we all have different things that we deal with in our actual body. 
And in heaven, we're not, we're not going to have to deal with that anymore. We're going to be perfect. All slightly different, maybe largely different in some ways, but we will all be given a spiritual body that doesn't have problems anymore. The, uh, um, you know, like to use an example of, car, of a car, uh, the, uh, the upholstery on the seats doesn't wear out, the, uh, the tires don't go flat, um, you know, spark plugs don't need to be changed. Um, nothing's going to go wrong. And we'll get to live forever uh, with a perfect spiritual body. So that's part of the hope and the new life that we have to look forward to. Um, we won't have the war in our mind between the law of God and sin and the flesh. Um, so we'll have a good, clear mind, pure motives. And we will also have a new body, too. So that's, that's something to look forward to. And uh, one thing I'm looking forward to most in this new life it's like actually what Paul talks about, being free from this war that we're co constantly in. I mean, does anyone really like having to battle against self and be in this fight all the time? I mean, it can, uh, it's, it's a distraction actually. Like, I, I, there's things I want to do and accomplish, but I, I can't always do it because of weakness in my body or my mind. And I won't have to deal with that anymore. I can just set my mind to something in heaven and go for it and do it and be able to accomplish it. And uh, it's going to feel good. I'm looking forward to that. Um, it's, yeah, it's going to be nice. <laughs> so this, I mean, these two things alone should be enough for us to want to serve Jesus. Um, but the greatest thing is actually love. Not the hope of a, just a new body or a new mind, the hope of being right, but love is actually the greatest reason for wanting a new life and going for it, because I want to be with Jesus in heaven because I see him on that cross. Enduring discomfort, fighting my battle for me, and dying in his human body to give me a spiritual body. When I see that type of love that Jesus has for me, it breaks my heart. Um, he's, uh, he really is worthy of being worshipped. And I hope that all of you, if, if there's any type of uh, rebellion in your life against God, or if there's some place where you haven't surrendered to him, um, take a look at Jesus on the cross and contemplate that type of love. He's made all provision for you to overcome anything. We don't have to go to um, the things we go to in this life to seek the rest that we should have in God. So if, you're, if there's something in your life that um, will keep you out of heaven and you know you're doing it, um, set it aside. Just, in fact, don't worry about setting it aside right away. Contemplate Jesus on the cross, and you'll want to get rid of whatever that thing is in your life. Um, really take some time today on Sabbath and think about Jesus and what he's done for you. And uh, it'll change your life. You'll have a new life. Is there someone here that wants to continue to live in that new life or even wants that new life today if you haven't surrendered? Is there someone either or continue or, or get it? Amen. Let's